The UN's limitations have been left completely exposed. Over half a million people have fled Ukraine. Ripples are being felt across Europe and the world. The Russian onslaught has left hundreds dead on both sides, and President Putin has put his tactical nuclear weapons on alert. Yet, the UN has failed to censure Russia, let alone bring an end to the violence. I'm Jafar Hasnan, and today's newsmaker is the inability of the United Nations to act decisively against Russia. It is only the 11th instance of its kind. The United Nations has convened an emergency special session. As fighting escalates in Ukraine, UN member states have underscored the fact that Russia's ongoing military offensive on Ukraine is a violation of its integrity and sovereignty. The vote on the draft resolution will carry political weight, as it effectively expresses the will of the member countries at large. Although Russian strikes are reportedly largely targeting Ukrainian military facilities, we have credible accounts of residential buildings, critical civilian infrastructure, and other non-military targets sustaining heavy damage. This escalating violence, which is resulting in civilian deaths, including children, is totally unacceptable. Enough is enough. Soldiers need to move back to their barracks and leaders need to move to peace. Civilians must be protected. International humanitarian and human rights law must be upheld. Yesterday, Russian nuclear forces were put on high alert. This is a chilling development. The mere idea of a nuclear conflict is simply inconceivable. Nothing can justify the use of nuclear weapons. If Ukraine does not survive, intention, survive, international peace will not survive. If Ukraine does not survive, the United Nations will not survive. Have no illusions. If Ukraine does not survive, we cannot be surprised if democracy fails next. Now we can save Ukraine, save the United Nations. Save democracy and defend the values we believe in. The Russian army does not pose a threat to the civilians of Ukraine, is not shelling civilian areas and areas and cities where Russian armed forces have taken control, and these areas are seeing citizens living their lives normally. It is important to remember that such emergency special sessions are summoned only when there is a lack of unanimity among the Security Council's permanent members. On Friday, Russia vetoed a Security Council resolution that would have deplored Moscow's attack on Ukraine. China's decision to abstain was viewed by the West as a win that demonstrated Russia's isolation. But the fact remains that the UN Security Council failed in its prime primary responsibility of maintaining international peace and security, especially at a time when Moscow was indulging in nuclear saber rattling. In the beginning, it was a Russian attack, and we evaluated it with experts, soldiers and lawyers. Now it has turned into a war. This is not a military operation. It is officially a state of war. And joining me now from London is Paul Ingram, an expert on nuclear disarmament and director of Emergent Change. In Washington, D.C., we have Jeffrey Stacey. He was a senior advisor to the U.S. State Department under the Obama administration. And completing our panel is George Samueli. He is in Budapest. He is a senior research fellow at the Global Policy Institute. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us here on the Newsmakers today. When we look at the past uh, two decades, the UN has done little to nothing to end conflicts in the world. Do you think, Jeffrey, the, US, the, the UN can play an effective role 
in ending the war between Russia and Ukraine? Well, it can in the sense that this has been one of the primary forums for international attention to focus right in New York, where all of the world gathers on a regular basis to expose the complete lack of legitimacy, law, and human rights, and much more that the UN Charter and the Helsinki Convention stand for. It's where Ukraine has received enormous support. It's also where representatives of the world's leading countries and all countries have joined to condemn this severe violation of international law. And we are proud of the Ukrainian people for standing up and showing us what democracy is like on the ground when you are under assault. But now, the UN does have a flaw, if not numerous flaws. We can start the UN reform by making sure that if the country that is invading another country cannot be the president of the UN Security Council, that the secretary general can take over in extreme circumstances. I mean, it's absurd to have the Russian quote unquote president of the council, a temporary position that just means that the chair of the meeting doing it, well, rockets are raining down and all sorts of assaults across the landscape are taking place that we all join in condemning today. That must stop. And ongoing UN reform must be a high priority as this crisis recedes. But the Secretary General has been stalwart, and we salute him and all the employees of the United Nations who are doing valuable work across the world. Okay, so the UN has helped in exposing Russia's uh, illegitimate actions in Ukraine. And also, it has, it has helped in gathering support for Ukraine. George, but is that going to stop President Putin from attacking Ukraine? Well, look, um, the United Nations is working as it was designed to work. The only reason why the United Nations has been a success story as against uh, the League of Nations, which was a spectacular failure, was because the architects of the United Nations created a situation whereby the prerogatives of the great powers would be respected. That was the whole point. That's why the League of Nations failed, and that's why great powers walked out of the League of Nations, because it uh, was in their way. That's the United Nations. Now, it's always very amusing that suddenly it's a crisis of the United Nations, only when the Western powers are not getting what they want. In the United States and the United Kingdom, two United Nations Security Council members, invaded Iraq in defiance of the United Nations Security Council. Three permanent members of the United Nations Security Council opposed the United States invasion of uh, Iraq. That wasn't the crisis of the United Nations. United States, the United States, NATO bombed Yugoslavia for 11 weeks, also in violation of, of uh, UN Security Council. That was also not a crisis of the United Nations. But it becomes a crisis when uh, a non-Western power acts in its own self-interest. And it's clear that this is a matter of its uh, national self-interest. Russia is acting in much the way that India acted when it invaded Pakistan in 1971 in support of its fellow nationals in Bengal. That is what okay. Russia's done. The United Nations cannot do this, get, not get involved, because Russia is a great power, and it's one of the architects of the United Nations. Okay, Paul, uh, before I come to you, I just want to get uh, a response from Jeffrey on this. Jeffrey, is the UN a hypocrite? Well, all international institutions have their flaws. Hypocrite might be going a bit too far. It's very clear where the United Nations as a whole stands, where the Secretary General stands. And my colleague doesn't even take time in his, you know, rant about issues from decades ago to condemn <laughs> what Russia has done in the strongest terms. He should start with that and then get along to supporting how we can reform the UN. I'd like to hear him defend Vladimir Putin right now. Okay, Paul, I will come to you, but I would like to get a response uh, from George on this. Certainly, George, there's no way Russia's actions can be justified right now. Well, 
uh, as I said, Russia's actions are not dissimilar to what India did in Pakistan in 1971 in support of its fellow nationals in Bengal. Uh, it was intervention uh, because their fellow members were, uh, the fellow nationals were uh, facing massacre. This is what has been going on in Ukraine since two, uh, 2015, 2014 rather, 15,000 people have been killed in the Donbass. The Ukrainian government, which is not a democracy, it came to power as a result of an overthrow. No, George, of if the, I may interject, uh, legitimate right now, government. Russia, if I may interject, George, please. Let... In, in, yeah, Russia it right now is in violation of the 1994 yes. Budapest Memorandum and also the 1945 uh, UN Charter no. Article 2. Certainly there is no justification for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. No, no that, that isn't true. The Budapest Memorandum is something completely different um, uh, because basically the, uh, the, the Budapest Memorandum provided just generalities generalities on the part of all of the uh, signatories. Do you condemn what Russia has done? The territorial George, integrity. Why should I get a, what's it? What is it to me? I am simply explaining. It is a matter of politics. international human Russia rights is, and the uh, please, rule of law. Uh, please don't interrupt. Russia is acting in the way that great powers act. It is Russia has given clear warning for many, many years. Russia has countries. given warning for many, many years that it will not tolerate NATO expansion to you know, its borders. We would like it will to not, not tolerate, tolerate the conversion of Ukraine into a forward okay. base, a anti Russian forward finish. base of NATO. He's given any number of warnings about this, and you know the West, NATO, uh, continue to ignore it. Well, that's what happens. Okay, Paul, I'd nice. like to come to you now. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, go on. Sorry. Yes. So, uh, not long ago. The Russian President Vladimir Putin uh, put his country's nuclear forces on high alert. I want to stick to the topic of discussion today, which is the UN's role in stopping the war between Russia and Ukraine. What kind of challenge do you think that decision by the Russian President pose in terms of bringing this conflict to an end? So uh, I think uh, we um, we analysts have been talking for quite some time about whether Russia has a policy of escalate to de-escalate when it comes to nuclear weapons. What that means is using threats in order to demonstrate resolve, and the resolve then meaning that any adversary backs down. Uh, so this is uh, within uh, Russian um, strategy, strategic thinking. Uh, it's unclear what it exactly it means. But what it does mean is that uh, the Russian nuclear forces are more on alert and uh, that they could be used. Now, I don't want people to uh, to dive under their um, tables quite yet because uh, nuclear deterrence and nuclear compellence, that is using nuclear weapons to uh, try to achieve an outcome, uh, it involves nuclear threats. Every country with nuclear weapons has an implied threat to use them. Otherwise, nuclear deterrence doesn't work. And what I think we're seeing here is a demonstration from Putin, and it's not the first, that he is prepared to contemplate the use or the threat of use more accurately of nuclear weapons uh, in order to get what he wants. Uh, now, um, this is clearly to be condemned, and I do condemn the invasion of Ukraine. But I think as well, at the same time, we need to understand that, uh, that all of us that engage in nuclear deterrence are involved in this system that, it, that uh, implies nuclear threat. And all of us have been involved, uh, and by us I mean governments, have been involved in creating this crisis that we see today. It has not come out from nowhere. Uh, it, it has been uh, the creation of the history over the last 20 odd years. Now, we saw at the end of the Cold War, President uh, George uh, Bush uh, talk about a new world order. What he meant was a unipolar world run by the United States. What we need to do now, and this is why I welcome this program so much, is to be talking about the reform of global governance, not just the United Nations, but how great powers interact. Because unless we do so, we will have more and more of these conflicts and the ability of nation states to cooperate to tackle the global catastrophic risks that my center at Cambridge, the Center for the Study of Existential Risks, looks at all the time, 
and is look and is seeing a significant deterioration of uh, our ability as governments, as a global community, okay. to deal with these threats. Okay, Jeffrey. <clears throat> I mean, uh, Paul, you came up with a very good. Uh, uh, idea. Certainly, we should be talking about how global powers interact, but uh, for that, we need uh, a lot more time. Right now, let's just stick to what the United Nations can do. Jeffrey, what should be the UN's response to Russia? Well, with respect to my Cambridge colleague, first, we need to end a war. Then we can reform the United Nations. Now, the International Criminal Court which coordinates a great deal with the United Nations, has opened an investigation of human rights violations and war crimes in Ukraine, committed by Russia and Belarusia. So that needs to proceed. It needs to be supported. It needs to be pursued to its ends. And we need to try Vladimir Putin, if he ever leaves his country, I mean, my word, he won't even walk to the end of a long table these days. He should be snatched sent to The Hague, tried, and convicted. I just want to pick up That's on one of the points you made about difference. ending the war, uh, Jeffrey, if I may. I just want to pick up on one of the points you, uh, you made about ending the war. Yes. Does the UN have the capacity and the capability to end the war in Ukraine? Partly and partly not. It does in the sense that it is the primary form where world powers meet and where they get to confront one another. And the resolution condemning the war crimes violations and much more, a violation of the UN Charter, took place in an extraordinary General Assembly meeting. Listening to the words of the Ukrainian ambassador were compelling, moving. And they have moved members of the United Nations. We saw strong statements. We'll get more from everyone from the Pope to the UN Secretary General. So yes, in a sense, it can. Now we do need to find ways to reform, for example, the Security Council. And one way that we can do this, if Russia would ever allow it, that's the inherent problem here that my colleagues have referred to, is that it can veto any rule change. But what we need is an extraordinarily high bar Jeffrey, in rare so circumstances. Can the US. So can the you US. can vote on the UN Security Council to actually boot a member out of the United Nations, or at least out of the UN Security Council. Jeffrey, to begin I'm sorry with. for interrupting again, but so can the US. The US can also veto any rule change, right? Yes, that's not the issue. The issue is what the rule change should be. It's it's a flawed, inherent system. Anything can be vetoed. That's the primary problem here. Okay, George. I mean, look at the UN Rights Commission, Human Rights Commission. Okay, Jeffrey, A bunch of human rights violators for years were on this commission. There's another problem. Okay, George, let me come to you. According to the West and much of the United Nations, Russia has a very isolated position in global world order now. How concerned is Russia about that, in your view? Well, obviously, Russia is very, very unhappy about it. On the other hand, uh, China and India are both abstained at the UN Security Council meeting. Um, China and India are the two most populous nations on Earth, so their views uh, count for quite a bit. The problem with the, when the West starts uh, uh, kind of mobilizing against Russia uh, in the way that it is doing now, and a lot of hot air and bluster, we, we've heard some of it today, uh, about we're going to arrest Vladimir Putin, take him to the International Criminal Court, uh, the same International Criminal Court that the United States does not recognize the jurisdiction of, the same International C Criminal Court that it didn't allow the prosecutors to enter the United States, the same International Criminal Court that the U.S. has legislation on the books saying that they will actually seize uh, any uh, American uh, who has been arrested by the ICC and bring them back to the United States. So, you know, we can skip all that posture. But the problem is that when you um, isolate Russia like this and start threatening the Russian leaders, it reinforces their feelings that they are up against it and a, and a West that is against them. And then if, the if, if I may interject here now, now. They, feel, they feel that they are in a war 
a war that they have been subjected, they've been subjected to horrific invasions twice in the 20th century, Napoleon's oh, invasion, pleased. and they're already feeling it now. Okay, you so, made your point, George, if I may interject. Way to go about this now. Just let me finish, let me finish, and then you'll get to talk. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was, okay, uh, let me, uh, just very quickly, the way to end this now is to have peace negotiations and to tell Zelensky, look, get whatever agreement you can now, neutrality is a perfectly reasonable solution, demilitarization, oh. and, you become, and you get the neutrality that Finland had very successfully ever since World War II. I think that's a very good deal. George, I want to I stick to the latest developments. We don't have time to talk about what led to what we are witnessing right now between Russia and Ukraine. I did not see any statement coming from any Western leaders threatening Russia. In fact, President Putin was the one when he announced this military operation in Ukraine. He said along the lines that whoever comes in Russia's ways is going to face consequences he or she has never faced before. Mm -hmm. If they get themselves involved, and there are already uh, moves on the part of NATO powers to get themselves involved in this, um, that is an existential matter for Russia. It's something that wiser political leaders in the past, Eisenhower in 1956 over Hungary, Lyndon Johnson uh, in 1968 over Czechoslovakia, said, we don't like it, but we just have to accept it because this is an existential matter for Russia. If you get involved uh, in Ukraine, you know, start sending arms there, then you know, there's going to be an almighty, horrific, uh, catastrophic war. You have to stay out. You like it, you don't like it. You know, that's the reality. That's the geopolitical reality. It was much the same thing with, um, you know, uh, Jack Kennedy and Cuba. You know, Kennedy wasn't wasting his time arguing about the sovereignty of uh, Cuba, that Cuba has the right to station missiles. Okay. He just was planning an oh invasion of Cuba to take out the missiles and to take out Fidel Castro. So that's what great powers do, and the United You're Nations You're just anti-American, that's all you are. Okay. George, I get your point. Let me put it to uh, Paul. Paul, so as I understand mm. from what George has said, and George, you may disagree with uh, what I have uh, made out of your opinion. Basically, international law has no place in the world. Paul. So um, I think I have some sympathy for some of the things that George is saying. I think we do need to be aware of the ways in which we have contributed to the crisis. And we do need to be aware of the way in which we have backed Russia into a corner. I repeat, I condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It was unforgivable and action needs to be taken. Both can be true. I also have some sympathy with the idea that was expressed that uh, we need to finish this war before we get on to reforming the Security Council. But don't forget that the Atlantic Charter was signed in 1942, right in the middle of the Second World War, and that was what gave birth to the United Nations. It's never too early to be thinking about the future. And when we think about the future, we need Russia in it, not out of it. Our biggest mistake has been to see European security as separate from Russia when Russia is part of Europe. We need to pull them into a common security agenda rather than a collective security of us against them. And that's the crucial has dimension where we... Uh, Putin has not actually... Putin did not reject it in the late 1990s. He was quite interested in the idea, but he the negotiations never started. Oh, yeah. But what I'm talking about is we need to see Russia beyond Putin. I mean, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that is that Russia is a part of Europe and is a part of the global order now and in the future. And we have to recognize that and we have to move in ways that give Russia an off ramp, an off ramp from the current crisis. And I see no effort being made by the West to create that off ramp. And President that's Macron a serious gave problem, him an offer, however yeah. much we judge. Uh, yes, and the rest of the West has not been backing Jeffrey, I see, I, I see your reaction to what Paul has to say, please, as Tevin. Mr. Macron, Mr. Schultz, Mr. Blinken, a friend and mentor of mine, and many others have given him an off-ramp. Putin himself called for an off-ramp with the Minsk process and then trounced it. Macron was even on the phone with him a couple of days ago as shells were raining down on Kyiv. What on earth are my colleagues talking about if they cannot condemn this in the strongest terms? 
They lose their I legitimacy instantly. It. I have I have condemned it. And Russia's I've condemned spot it more than in, one. in the and the point in the I'm trying to or make the current order ends when they oh, cross let these Jeff, red lines. Let Jeff they lose all the, legitimacy. And if you don't condemn it in the strongest terms, you are part of promoting and continuing the problem as at least one it. and possibly another of my colleagues are today. Okay, gentlemen. You're creating uh, a straw man. Uh, Jeffrey, I'll have to give you the last word here, but I think uh, it's not about just condemnation, right? Because certainly right now the idea is to stop the war between Russia and Ukraine here on the Newsmakers. So we will That's keep true. discussing how to bring this war to an end. And thank you for watching. You can follow us on Twitter at the underscore Newsmakers and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Jafar Hasnan. See you next time.